ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a riveting discussion that delves into the heart of the financial world. Today, we're honored to have a true luminary in the trading industry. With us, a name that resonates with decades of wisdom and success, David Lawrence, CEO and the co-founder of the concept trading. Thank you for joining us, David. Thank you, Michael. It's good to be here. Let's begin with your journey in trading. Um, could you provide us a brief overview of how you got started and your experience in the industry? Uh, maybe not such a brief brief story, but uh, I was I grew up in grew up in the country on a farm uh, in Western New South Wales here in Australia, and was working um, as a what they call a jackaroo, which is just a, a farmer. Um, after I left school and did that for a number of years until I realized that, you know, um, my father sold the property and I had, you know, I was working pretty hard to try and save money to buy my own place, but uh, they don't pay farmers very well here in Australia. So, uh, unless you own the place. So I had a friend down in Sydney who um, I went to school with who was working on uh, what was called the future floor. Um, and this is in the uh, early 90s, 1994 it was. Um, and the futures was uh, open outcry. This was before screen trading came along. So uh, open outcry is when you're uh, flashing signals and buy sell and you're wearing funny colored jackets. Only enough, this is the jacket I wore on the floor. Um, and that was in the 90s. So that kicked off my... Um, I guess my career and I worked on the floor until it went uh, computerized in, in the 1999 um, it went computerized and this was before you know um, well the online trading um, particularly in stocks um, was only just starting in the in the mid to late 90s um, and futures hadn't really made that transition to screen trading as well as stocks had already had uh, so I spent a couple of years uh, as a broker uh, in futures until a, another friend of mine um, said, I've got this new product that's um, in the UK and I want to bring it to Australia. Can you help me? And I said, sure. And that was called CFDs. Um, so we launched CFDs into Australia in 2002 and were the first company to bring CFDs to the country. Uh, that company is called Deal for Free back then. Um, because it was just trading spread, which is what we do in currency trading. Uh, that company has gone on to big and better things called CMC Group, which is um, quite a large company globally now. Um, and uh, we left CMC, or we left CMC for a reason, and went to a company called MF Global. And I was running the dealing desk uh, in CFDs for MF Global for from 2004 to 2011, so seven years. Um, and was running uh, their FX dealing desk in Hong Kong when that company went bankrupt. I had a job on Friday and didn't have one on Monday. So um, got disillusioned with corporate life and decided to um, go and trade for myself. I worked with a company, an educational company out of Sydney, uh, set up their uh, proprietary trading system for those people who had gone through their educational course and wanted, um, wanted funding. Um, and after that, I was just basically trading myself and prop trading uh, in FX until uh, we decided to um, create our own prop trading firm and uh, use, using funds of some high net worth individuals so that we can capitalise people who are trading. So um, not such a short answer, but <laughs> that's, that's my history and, the, and my background. Over your 30-plus year career, what significant changes have you observed in the trading landscape and, and how have they impacted your trading strategy? The advent of, um, obviously, screen trading. Uh, you know, when I was on the future floor, it was all about flow trading, um, which is you know, volume and price. Um, and in trading currencies, there's no... You don't know the volume, right? Because it's, it's not a... Um, a reg regulated traders on a regulated exchange, there's no um, ticker of showing the volume. There's no, uh, as a retail broker, you don't get to see, or it's a retail trader, 
you don't get to see the depth of the market. Um, not the true depth. You might see what that broker is offering, like some brokers, uh, some FX brokers offer that uh, service, but um, you don't get to see what the big liquidity providers are, um, have or are trading. So using volume as, a, um, as an analysis tool um, is pointless in uh, retail FX trading. Um, so I guess that's one thing is um, adjusting from uh, f being a flow trader on the floor to screen trading and not relying on that flow, but having to rely on fundamental and technical analysis um, to try and uh, ascertain where price is going. Uh, I guess that's the biggest thing. And now recently there's these um, gamified um, prop trading firms, uh, which are uh, these challenge style firms where you're not really trading, it's only demo trading. Um, and that's been an uh, interesting field to see develop. Um, and one of the reasons why we built the concept uh, the way we did is to, um, it's like an old school prop firm, right? So it's uh, real funds real, and real trading. And if you've got the skills then um, and you've got the consistency, then you can build um, uh, a real capital base and uh, obviously wealth from that rather than this gamified trading pay a couple hundred dollars and you get a massive account um that's that's an interesting field and i've got some <laughs> got some reservations about those firms but i guess now it's um ai uh, the interesting field now is um how ai is going to impact the um, eas and automated trading um, and that's going to be i guess the next push over the next couple of years is um, seeing that develop and how uh, how people will uh, take advantage of that. Um, so, thanks for that. Um, so, what are the key principles or philosophies that have guided your trading approach throughout your career? To me, the uh, trading is not uh, it's not a, um, necessarily an IQ thing, right? It's not or EQ. It's not about emotional or um, intelligence. It's the three. Um, three defining factors of successful traders and i've known a lot over the years of successful traders but the three defining facts are one is patience two is discipline and three is persistence yeah so those three principles or defining factors um if you can coming up with a strategy or an edge uh is one thing but applying that um to your trading um is the most difficult part right having the discipline to be patient and wait for the opportunity or for your strategy to give you a signal um, is is paramount. Yeah, and you can't teach um, discipline. You can't teach patience. Um, you either have it or you don't. Uh, but you can get it. You can develop those skills. Um, and then there's persistence, right? So when you're having um, having a bad run of trading, um, and you know, or uh, yeah, I guess it's the worst it's if you're having a bad run on trades is having that persistence going, yeah, I'm here, this is the, this is what I want to do, This I'm going to make this a success, um, rather than just giving up and folding, yeah? So those three things, uh, I would say, are the uh, defining factors. Could you share some of the most memorable trades you've been involved in and the lessons you've learned from them? Yeah, I'll give you my biggest one. Um, it was... Just after the futures uh, future floor closed in 1999, and I said um, it was, I was um, trying to make them transition from being a flow trader to a screen trader. I did trade for myself for a couple of months um, after the floor closed in 99, um, and uh, that didn't go too well. And I'll tell you about the trade, um, and that's why I then went and uh, became a futures broker. But um, I was trading the Aussie dollar, and uh, it was getting close to 50 cents and I thought, you know, this, it's not going to go through 50 cents. 50 will hold, 50 will hold. And I was trading um, currency futures back then and so I um, effectively took on a trade and the Aussie dollar fell straight through 50 cents and it got to 48, but by that stage I'd been stopped out. I lost 150 grand in one night um, and that was all the money I had. So I'd lost everything in one trade um and yeah had to then go and um, get a job and work uh, work for someone else so the lesson in that to me was ego all right um 
don't let ego um, take control of your trading. Um, you know, there's two uh, there's two things that people struggle with with trading, and it's fear and greed. Yeah, and that was um, greed, thinking I was right, and ego, thinking that I was right. Um, and it cost me cost me a lot, um, not only financially but emotionally as well. So, um, you know, a big knock to the confidence. So, yeah, to me, that that lesson was: uh, don't let ego get in in the way of the trades. Um, you need to be um, emotionally detached from your positions um, and understand. Um, I have a saying now: is that belief is the death of intelligence. Yeah. So if you believe something, then you stop analyzing. Yeah. If you're relying on hope that the market's going to turn, then you stop analyzing. As soon as you do that, you're in trouble. Yeah. You've got to constantly analyze the market and the conditions and what's happening. And if it doesn't fit your picture, then get out of the trade um, rather than hope that the market's going to turn, like you're hanging on to a trade and it's going against you, it's going against you. I see people all the time um, you know, moving their stop loss out or removing their stop loss in the hope that the market will bounce and they'll get um, it all going their favour. That is um, letting your emotions take control of the trade and will always lead to trouble. That's a pretty good advice for us young traders. Like me, myself, I'm currently managing my emotions, my trainings as well. So that's a pretty yeah. good advice. Yeah, you've really got to... Um, and that's the beauty of what these auto um, autobots, the EAs. You know, they take away that um, that anxiety around trading, the fear and the greed. But um, you know, if you have a, a checklist, like a written down checklist of reasons to get into a trade, anyone can get into a trade. That's simple enough. It's how to manage the trade. It's what's going to define you or, uh, as a successful trader or not. Um, like any, like I have a saying: like anyone can get into a motor car and put their foot down on the accelerator. But if a, um, a kangaroo jumps out in front of you or a kid runs out in front of your car, how do you avoid that situation uh, safely? Um, it defines you as a good driver, or not, right? So um, with trading, as I say, anyone can get into a trade. Um, but I've seen good traders uh, get into a bad trade and make it um, profitable. And I've seen bad traders get into a good trade and make it a loss, right? So it's how you manage the trade. So having a checklist um saying well these are the reasons i'm getting into it and a checklist of saying these are the reasons i will exit the trade and by following that checklist then you will um try and remove or it should remove a lot of that anxiety or fear and greed around trade yeah and will uh, remove the emotion from it and so then you're constantly analyzing and saying well is it um, matching my checklist yes well then i need to get out or no it hasn't okay so i can stay in the track uh, thank Excellent. you so much for your insight. And I agree that a lot of traders need to have their checklist and their emotions in check as well. And their, you know, how do you manage risk in your trading activities? And how has your approach evolved over time? Managing risk is, uh, to me, is paramount, right? And, and you should have that as a part of your, when you're setting up your, um, your trading ideas and your trading strategy, you should have risk management as a part of, that checklist that we um, discussed previously, uh, part of that checklist should be what you're uh, willing to risk. Everybody's risk threshold is different, right? So when you're trading your own money, um, you know, your risk around trading your own money tends to be a lot looser, right? So when you're trading your own money, you might be taking 5% of your account balance as a risk or 10% of your account balance as a risk on the trade. Um, but when you're trading other people's money, that, you know, is a lot more circumspect and people tend to uh, lower that uh, quite significantly. What you've got to think about, though, is if you want the longevity, even risking 10% uh, on your own funds is uh, is high, right? If you're looking for that longevity, you've got to take into account you're going to have losses. No one um, is 100% correct every single trade, right? That's impossible. Um, so you're going to have losses and you've got to take that into account when you're um, designing your trading strategy and the risk around it. So most people uh, tend to um, use a percentage of their balance as a risk. So it might be um, you know, 0.5% or 1%, maximum 2% on a trade. 
uh, which allows you to um, you know, suffer a, a string of drawdowns without blowing the account. Yeah, and even when you're trading on prop accounts, um, like our prop accounts, the tightest um, drawdowns are five percent from the opening balance. Um, so if your very first trade is risk one percent and you that's a loss, then you immediately only got four percent left. Right. So risking one percent on a um, an account that has a five percent drawdown doesn't make financial sense. Right. You need to make sure that. Okay, well, let's start with uh, risking 0.25% on the trade. If I lose it, that's not a huge hit to my 5% drawdown. Um, and But if it makes it, then I'm, um, you know, if I have a target of 2 to 1, then I'm up half a percent and then you can start to build. So I guess with risk management, is um, there's a tongue in cheek saying, if in trouble, double. Um, and that's not the way to financial success trading right you don't um, add to losing positions but you add to winning positions and you uh, earn the right to increase your risk so what i mean by that is once you've had a couple of winning trades you can up the risk from 0.25 percent to half a percent or one percent because you've got more of a buffer of a drawdown but you're also starting to get that confidence and um and that winning feeling um, that's when you start to increase your trade. So Jesse Livermore um, was a great, um, I guess, uh, proponent, uh, proposer of this. Um, and Warren Buffett as well is all about discipline and adding to winning trades rather than um, trying to average into a losing trade by you know, adding to a losing trade. If it's a losing trade, get out. You know? You've got it wrong. Um, find the next trade. You know? So... Risk management, uh, coming back to your uh, question, is everybody's profile is different. But when you're trading other people's money, um, you've got to take into account what the drawdown is with the prop accounts um, and adjust your risk per trade accordingly. So in a field as dynamic as trading, how do you stay updated with the latest market trends and developments? Market trends, to me, is um, all about economies right so um what drives market trends and i'm presuming you're talking about price here um because trading is trading that's um there's yeah sure the trading um, platforms and software and now ai and eas um are will constantly uh, develop and improve although metaquotes has been around since 2010 or thereabouts and hasn't really changed um MT4 hasn't changed since it launched. Um, MT5 is very similar. Uh, but there are obviously um, companies developing and producing um, new trading platforms all the time. And that's, um, to me, is, you know, I guess going to trade shows and seeing, um, seeing these platforms um, is one way of doing that. But in terms of market trends uh, and keeping updated with uh, what's happening is, it's literally just reading the news every day um, and trying to work out where the economies are going. So right now, China's, um, as we speak, Chinese economy is um, really under the pump. Um, you know, they're trying to cut rates, they're trying to defend their currency, um, and their their economy is um, not doing as well as everybody expected it would post-COVID. Um, and so what the flow-on effect of that is, um in terms of how does that affect um currency well the biggest effect would it have is like australia's um china's australia's like largest trading partner uh, you know australia sells a lot of commodities so that's going to have an impact on the australian currency and you can see that in the price action so understanding where um economies are and they i guess in the um in the cycle of boom and bust which economies always do um you know the usa is currently sort of um probably on the down downward slide heading towards a bust uh, you know there's been discussions about the um i guess the soft landing and the recession um so yeah it's just about reading the news and trying to and a lot of market economists right i didn't do economics at school um i didn't do economics at, um, at the university but i love the cause and effect um, being a farmer, 
you know, uh, understanding cause and effect um, to me is what keeps me in, uh, interested in the industry. And so as China, um, you know, is lowering interest rates, US is raising interest rates, what's the flow on effect of those um, different diverging um, pathways and where did, where's the opportunity there? How will the psychological discipline play in your trading success? And do you have any strategies for maintaining emotional balance during market fluctuations? I think we've touched on this a bit before, but um, the psychology of trading is probably the most difficult part that any uh, new trader or old trader um, has to deal with. Yeah, um, your risk management, uh, trading strategies, um, trade management, um, you know, managing your time, managing your money, that that's all uh, relatively simple. But understanding uh, your approach psychologically to the market and controlling that is will be a constant job and constant um, application. And it, it sort of comes back to what I was talking about before in terms of fear and greed and um, trying to take that anxiety of um, the fear of missing out or the fear of losing money, um, or the um, you know the greed of uh, trying to make money, um, those emotional, um, I guess those emotions tend to make you get in and out of trades um, at the wrong time. Um, so understanding the um, how you deal with those emotions psycho um, psychologically uh, is, I think, very important. And I'm not a psychologist, and I, um, I, I can't um, speak for other people on how to deal with it. But I go back to the checklist idea, which is trying to reduce that um, impact of those emotions as much as possible by having a checklist and um, having the discipline to stick to that checklist, saying, if it meets the reasons for me to take a trade, then I'm taking it. And if it meets the reason for me to getting out of the trade, I'm getting out of it. So then it's just um, building up your discipline and patience to make sure that you're um, sticking to that checklist, which will therefore reduce the impact of the fear and greed and the anxiety around trading. Yeah. Um, I guess that's the best way I can uh, potentially answer that. With the rise of technology and algorithmic trading, how do you balance traditional trading methods and these new tools? Do I use technology? Um, is it, sorry, was that the question? Or I'm a more traditional dinosaur, as you can tell by all the grey hair. Um, I trade on price action, um, and I've got a pretty simple checklist um, for reasons to get into a trade, um, and a simple checklist for getting out of it. Because uh, going back to that checklist idea, you don't want a checklist of 10, 15, reasons to get in or out of a trade because you'll never find a track right? um, but you need more than just one reason as well so somewhere between three or um, three to six reasons to get into a trade now that might be um, a Fibonacci level it might be a Bollinger Band whatever that is that you've identified that edge that you've identified uh, where you can make money um, you know, that might be one reason um, price action or whatever the reasons are. It, might, it could be technical analysis um, uh, or an indicator uh, that gives you those reasons. In terms of technology, um, you know, to me, it's more about the uh, trading platforms and, and the tools that come with that, uh, such as you know, risk management, order entry interfaces, um, and those kind of things that uh, I would use. Um, I'm, not seen an EA um, be successful over a long period of time. Um, EAs tend to have a shelf life. Uh, and then you're spending, or the person who wrote the code for that EA is spending as much time uh, adjusting the, uh, the code because the market conditions change. And they spend more time doing that than I do um, when I'm doing my uh, uh, um my trading, which is uh, you know, outside of EAs, is discretionary. Uh, so my discretionary trading takes me half an hour a day, um, and I wouldn't want to be spending all day writing code that would drive me insane. Um, yeah, so I'm not um, 
I'm not against technical um, technology and its introduction into trading. Um, I just haven't seen haven't seen it work. Um, so uh, to me, every um, there's no wrong or right way to trade, right? Um, and you don't try and keep up with other people. It, this is not keeping up with the Kardashians. You just the only thing you need to focus on is your own account balance, right? Um, and if someone said, "Oh, I made a thousand pips," well, that's great. But if it's only at one cent a pip, so what, right? Um, but someone said, oh, "I made a thousand percent." Okay, well, um, that's a, a different kettle of fish. But can you sustain that for twelve months, two years, five years? Right? Um, so there's no right or wrong. There's no strategy that's right or wrong. The only there's only one wrong thing, and that's if your account's uh, losing money. Right? Um, and that's the sole focus is to make sure that your your winning trades are uh, making more than your losing trades, so the account is growing. Wow, that's that's a pretty good advice right there, folks. Like, um, I totally, totally agree that, that you don't need to compare yourself to other people when it comes to trading. Like, it's all, it's also for me, it's also about like self discovery, you know, personal improvement. Yeah, well, trading will make you very honest, right? Um, very honest with yourself, because if you continue to lie to yourself, then your account's going to go um, belly up. Um, and if you continue to lie to the missus of where the money's going, <laughs> you're not going to have a relationship. So, um, yeah, the trading is, uh, makes someone a very honest person, honest with themselves is what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, can you discuss the importance of diversification in the trading portfolio and how you go about selecting various assets or forex to trade? Well, to me, diversification uh, is more about uh, long-term investments, right? So um, if you're designing a portfolio uh, with diversification in mind, that's more to me about um, you know, managed funds and, and stock trading uh, with the, the concept of you know, uh, being in those positions or trades um, as an investment tool over a 5-10 year investment horizon. Um, for trading currencies or uh, for prop trading, that's not feasible. Um, so it's not to me trading, um, prop trading or currency trading, not so much about diversification, but understanding correlations, right? So um, the correlations between currencies, such as the Canadian and the Aussie dollar and the Kiwi dollar, um, uh, have pretty high uh, correlations because they're all commodity currencies, yeah? Um, US dollar and Japanese yen have um, high correlations because they're safe haven currencies in that when the uh, stock market is um, tanking, as it is this week, um, people um, take their money out of uh, risk assets, such as stocks, and put their money into safe assets, which is um, the two largest safe assets are the uh, Japanese government bonds, JGBs, or the US treasuries, so US bonds. So when the stock market's tanking, you don't want to be um, short US dollar when short yen. Because if you're short both those currencies at that time, then your trade's going to go belly up, yeah? Because both of those currencies will appreciate. Well, similar if the commodity markets are rallying, such as oil and iron ore, you don't want to be short Aussie and you don't want to be short Canadian. Um, so it's not so much about diversification, but understanding correlations and um, what your portfolio exposure is to those correlations. Are there any specific trading strategies or techniques that you've found consistently effective throughout your career? Any uh, trading strategies that are effective? Um, I've seen lots of people do lots of different things um, and uh, be very successful with them. So yes, there are a lot, but that's, uh, a very um, particular thing. Let me put it this way. Right? So I've got a strategy that's, um, that works for me. Yeah. And I guess I, I, the way I um, give you an analogy here is that a bespoke uh, tailor made suit, yeah, it fits like a glove. I'm, I'm comfortable to sit in it, to walk in it, to move around in it. Um, and it works for me. 
Now, I might give you that suit to wear and it might be tight in some places or loose in other places. You might be able to move around in it, but it's not as comfortable for you as it is for me. Yeah. So trading strategies are much like that in that what works for me may not work for you. And I've seen guys, I've seen um, you know, a successful trader, all he does is trade the euro dollar for the first two hours of the euro open um, and he uses pivot levels uh, as his um, trading strategy um, and where the pivots, uh, you know, depending on where the, uh, the euro opens um, around that pivot. And that's all he trades, two hours a day around pivots uh, and only on the euro. Um, I know Duncan, or, or otherwise known as Tex, um, trades just the HSBC stock on the Hang, Camp, on the Hang Seng. Um, and that's all he trades. And he, um, he flow trades that. Um, very successful. Uh, an, old, uh, an old friend of mine um, out of Toronto, um, well, he's Australian, but he now lives in Toronto, trades uh, bonds and trades the spread between the US 10-year bond and the Australian 10-year bond. So the, um, and very successful. So I guess the point here and to answer your question is that um, there are lots of different ways to trade and there's lots of different um, methodologies that you can use. Um, and it's, I guess it's understanding market pricing and what drives that price is the most important thing. Um, and then finding a way to get in and out of that market that you can do it and you can do it consistently and successfully. Um, and that might be um, using moving average crossovers. It might be using RSI. It might be using lots of different indicators and tools that you can employ to build a strategy that gives you that edge. Um, but yeah, as I said before, there's no right or wrong in trading as long as your account's growing. Then who am I to say you shouldn't be doing that? If your account's growing by one or two percent a week, um, well, there's nothing wrong with that. That's 100 percent right and if you're just doing it off the back of uh, um rsi then nothing wrong with that it might be a stochastics you get where i'm coming from yes yes, yes. yeah so um i've seen a lot of successful strategies and i've seen uh, a lot of unsuccessful strategies but um it's to me it's about the person and the individual and the application that they put into those strategies and the uh, trading trade management that makes it uh, someone a successful trader. So for this question, um, I'm also curious as well, and I think you've tackled this on our previous question. So here we go. Um, how do you handle periods of market uncertainty or volatility? And do you adjust your strategies accordingly or not trade at all? I don't adjust the strategy, right? So my strategy, um, been using it for uh, a long time and it's not something that I'm going to mess with. So it's not so much the strategy. Um, it's about waiting for the market conditions to meet my strategy. Yeah, And that comes back to that patience and discipline again. If the market's um, volatility is um, not giving me a signal um, or um, giving me a reason to be cautious, then, yeah, you're not trading, right? There's that old saying of, uh, if in doubt, stay out. Um, and that holds true. Um, so I don't think adjusting yourself to market conditions um, is a a smart way to approach it. Right? So if the market volatility um, spikes, aka like when the Russia invaded Ukraine, um, that might be something that gives you an opportunity, but it also might be something to go, whoa, whoa, whoa okay, let's just wait for the market to calm down. And it will eventually, right? The market repeats, history repeats. And because of that repetition, that provides opportunity for us to be able to make money as a trader because we know the market's going to repeat and um, give us an opportunity. And if it's not today, and it may not be tomorrow, it might be next week or the week after that. And that comes back again to being patient and having the discipline to wait for the market conditions to meet your trading, your ideal trading strategy. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't get too concerned about market volatility. Um, you know, there's at times I, I enjoy the volatility because that provides opportunity. But, um, yeah, I always hark back to if in doubt, stay out. 
and that comes back to your checklist. Right? Having that checklist of saying, well, are the market conditions meeting my reasons for entering? Or um, if I'm in a trade, are the market conditions changed? Um, and therefore, my strategy, um, you know, it, it's not meeting my um, uh, reasons to get out of a the trade, then I stay in it. If it does, then I get out. Yeah. Um, what are some misconceptions about trading that you would like to clarify, especially for those who are new to the industry? Oh, the biggest one I have is um, people's retail people's understanding of how um, brokers operate um, and how brokers make money. Uh, that is the biggest misconception. Having been on the other side, having been in FX uh, dealing, um, running an FX dealing desk for a number of years. Um, and now you know, being more on the on the buy side and seeing retail and uh, all these forums about how people are uh, their fear of brokers and they, that brokers are just there to uh, rip them off. Um, they're not, right? Um, brokers make money in four ways. Right? They make money um, through financing, which is called the swap fee. Um, they make money through um, com uh, the spread um, or commissions. Now that they've driven the spread so low, FX brokers are forced to um, charge commissions on trade. Five, ten years ago, you never saw that, right? You never saw commissions on FX trading because the spreads were, you know, seven, eight, ten pips. Um, and now the spreads are down to one pip. Brokers can't make as much money, so they're having to charge commission. So to me, if you were an uh, FX trader and you're trading a commission account, you don't understand what's going on. Because um, if you're trading on, com uh, on a commission account, you're paying commission every time. But if you're trading on a non-commission account with FX, you can buy, um, let's say you, you buy the Aussie dollar at 67 cents. Um, you're immediately out of the market by one pip or two pips, whatever the broker spread is. But as soon as that um, the um, the bid price comes up to uh, 67, you'll break break even. It's not going to cost you anything. You get out of the trade at 67 um, at the same price you got in. You don't pay commissions. It's trade free, right? So commission trading is to me a, um, a major mis misconception. So that's two ways the brokers make money: is um, swap fees. And um, commissions or uh, spreads. Uh, the other way they can make money is by making a market. Um, and I'll come back to that and I'll uh, go to the fourth one. The fourth one is um, funds on deposit. Right? So you deposit your thousand dollars or whatever with uh, with the broker. That's held at a bank, um, which in Australia and under AFSL laws has to be held segregated and separate from their funds. That's obviously going to earn interest at that bank. Now, you know. Two years ago, the interest rates were um, zero, so I wasn't going to earn a lot. But now it's around four or five percent. They're earning four or five percent interest on your thousand dollars. Do they give you any of that interest? Now, most FX brokers do, some don't. Um, but the brokers that do pay you that interest will, you know, they might earn four percent and they're paying you three percent. So they're picking up one percent haircut. Yep. So. Uh, interest rates on, on your cash, um, the swap fee on, on your trades, and the spread are the um, three major ways that uh, brokers make money. Um, and the fourth one is market making. Now, market making is when they take the other side of the trade. All right? It's not passed straight through to the LPs, LPs being a liquidity provider. So they're taking the other side of the trade. Now, this leads to the biggest issue I have with retail people not understanding brokers is the, the stop hunters. Now, you see a lot of people saying, oh, they're hunting my stops, um, or, you know, they've triggered my stop just to um, to take my trade out. And you're a minnow, right? Your trade of 0.1 lot is not going to bother a broker. They're not stop hunting your 0.1 lot. Even if you've got a one a standard um, FX lot, it's, it's minor, right? FX is $7 trillion a day. You think your one hundred thousand dollar trade value is going to bother a seven billion dollar market? No, the market makers are not hunting stops. They know where your orders are, and they will trade to that. And if we had more time, I'll explain that. And I'd probably need a whiteboard behind me. We'll explain how market makers make money 
Um, but that's more about the, uh, what the value of their book is. And, uh, uh, but they are not sitting there worried about your tiny little stop loss and trying to trigger it for, um, to make money. Other than that, I couldn't be bothered, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's, um, there's a lot of misconceptions um, from uh, retail traders about how FX brokers uh, operate. Um, and hopefully that might clear up a few things for people. Um, but yeah, that, uh, I think that's the biggest one. Yeah, yeah, I I agree. Uh, actually, I didn't know some of those things as well, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> like, whenever you search online, like about brokers, oh, well, you see like a lot of people, a lot of influencers in social media, like, hey, they're out for your money. You're, you're always going to be a loser to them, stuff like that. Yeah. Well, that's the market in general, right? Um, FX broken, uh, FX trading is pretty much a zero sum game. What I mean by that is for every loser, there is a winner, right? That's a zero sum game. So with the FX broken, um, if you've lost a thousand dollars, then someone's made a thousand dollars. Now that might be the broker, um, if he's a market maker and taking the other side of the trade. Or it might be Joseph over in um, South Africa who made a thousand dollars. Yeah. Um, or it could be that, uh, you know, uh, uh, one person made 500 and another person made 500. So for every loser, there is a winner. Yeah. Um, but the fact that um, the brokers are taking your money, no, they're just sitting in the middle. The market, right, is, um, is the movement of the price um, is taking your money. And the market's always right. And the market doesn't know who you are. Right? The market doesn't care about you in sitting in your little office or your little um, garage or wherever you are trading in this day and age on your mobile, probably at the beach. Um, you know, um, they don't, the market doesn't uh, care who you are. And as I said, it's a $7 trillion business every day. Um, your little trades are uh, insignificant in comparison um, to what's uh, the bigger picture. For the next question, how do you deal with losses or trades that didn't go as planned? And what strategies do you use to recover from setbacks? Um, yeah, that's, that's a good question. And I'd like to be able to give a decent answer, but I've always been a pretty confident person. Um, and as I mentioned before, when you're asking about my, um, my significant trade, uh, I guess my biggest issue is um, ego in terms of um, being overconfident. Um, having been in the industry for as long as I have and um, when I started in the industry I was working for major banks um, you know first job I, I had was with UBS um, and you know you have losses um, and you have losing trades it's part of the industry and um, understanding that those um, that having losing trades is part and parcel of trading um, affords me the ability to go, well, you know, um, I've just had a losing trade just means the next one's going to be a winner or I'm that much closer to the next winning trade. Um, you know, my average success is 50%, uh, which is not huge, right? So for every two trades I do, on average, I'll lose one of them. Um, but, you know, you've got to have the risk reward ratio on the right side. Uh, so my average losing my average uh, success rate is 50%, but my average um, uh, RR is 2.6. So for every losing trade, um, for every one I lose, I'm making 2.6 on, on the winner. So that puts me in um, you know, positive growth. So um, yeah, it's I understand that you know if you have a string of losers that hits you ment um, mentally and mental capital um, is paramount to protect um, because without mental capital your um, your you know financial capital will disappear and um, so you might have a million dollars but if you don't have the mental capacity to trade it properly you'll lose that million dollars whereas if you've got a thousand dollars and you've got the correct mental capacity you can turn that thousand into into a million dollars. Um, so it's understanding that um, losing trades will happen um, and 
if you're uh, persistent and disciplined with your strategy, things will turn around and you'll be able to come back and, um, you know, those losing trades will be paid for by the next few winning trades. That's, yes. I guess that's right. just understanding um, prob probabilities um, and that, you know, for every trade you've lost, then you're, the probabilities are that you're going to have a winning trade next. In your opinion, what qualities or skills differentiate a successful trader from a unsuccessful one? What makes a successful trader rather than, rather than uh, what makes a losing trader? Um, that comes back to those three things, persistence, patience, discipline. Yep. So um, as I think we've covered is that I've known lots of different traders around the world doing different things, different strategies. Um, and there's no... Uh, I guess consistency across um, across those, except for those three things. Um, you know, they're all very disciplined, um, and they're all patient for the uh, market to meet their trading reasons, rather than just trying to trade and make the um, the market fit you. All right. So I guess that's the biggest thing. Is um, to a, someone who's not successful as a trader is someone who uh, um, is disciplined with uh, their risk management and with their trade management um, you know they might be just doing okay and then they'll have a, a drink on a Friday night and blow their account because they're sitting there on their on their phone watching the footy um, and trading off their phone right that's ill discipline um, and or you know getting distracted by family and things and um, placing a trade on um, or they might might have had a fight with the missus, uh, or the missus might have had a fight with the hubby, and she goes and puts a trade on, um, not thinking of, um, correctly because of the emotional uh, impact of that uh, argument, and therefore they're um, placing a trade. So that's to me is the biggest thing right? is <clears throat> understanding um, how emotions can play out in your trading environment. Um, and making sure that you're um, being disciplined enough to prevent those um, those things from impacting your trading um, and having the patience to stick to your strategy. Have there been any mentors or individuals who have significantly influenced your trading philosophy or strategies? Um, again, this comes back to when I started, I was you know, in my mid-20s uh, on the futures floor. Um, and there's a couple of guys I looked up to there, um, you know, uh, Rambo and Elvis, funny names, but, you know, you're in a, um, the futures ball is pretty much like a, um, like a sports board, uh, a sports team locker room where you've got seven, 800 guys just, um, you know, full of testosterone and, and confidence. Um, and it was a, a fun environment to uh, live and experience, but Elvis and Rambo, uh, otherwise, uh, known as Tony Lepinatis and John Moulton, um, were guys that uh, were very successful on the floor. So it was just spending time with them and um, and seeing how they operated and how they managed their trades and managed their positions um, and seeing it play out live because you're in that uh, on that floor, you're seeing it happen. Um, and you're going, oh, okay, I, I understand what he's doing and how he's doing it now. Um, and then um, when I, uh, I guess, living in that environment, you know, day in, day out, um, didn't require me to um, look elsewhere to become successful in my own right, which uh, I eventually did. But um, making that transition to screen trading was, um, you're not seeing, their, seeing it happen, right? You can't see what other traders are doing. All you can see is um, the price action. And so, you know, it then became a matter of, okay, well, I need to understand technical analysis so, um, and understand fundamental analysis. So I went and did courses for those, um, which you, uh, I'm not sure if they're available globally, but, um, you know, in, a, in Sydney, Australia at the time, there were um, schools that taught uh, technical analysis um, and you know, fundamental analysis is uh, more about understanding economics. So... It was, um, I guess that I didn't have a mentor there um, in t going into screen trading, um, but it was uh, self-development 
really in the, uh, trying to understand how market conditions were changing. Um, and yeah, reading books like Jesse Livermore, which is the you know reminiscence of, of a stock operator. Um, you know, reading things like um, Charles Schwartz and uh, reading about Warren Buffett and how these guys um, you know ran their um, their trading uh, and looking into those. But uh, individual mentors yeah, were more going back to um, making friends on the futures floor. I mean, yeah, uh, just to expand on that. I think it's great to have mentors, um, and if you can find one who's willing to um, uh, spend time with you, then that's great. Um, but uh, finding those those people is um, is a, a probably the biggest challenge you're going to have. Is where do you find these people? Because there's lots of sharks out there who sell their education, um, which is you know not necessarily uh, going to do you any um, positive outcomes <laughs> probably teach you worse habits than you should be learning all right to top things off and for our final question what do you enjoy most about being a professional trader and what keeps you motivated even after decades in the in the industry uh, well the things that i like the most uh, about trading is i guess it, it gives me um, financial freedom um where i'm not you know rely on uh an employer um, you know, I am my own boss, um, which also gives me geographical freedom. As long as I've got an internet connection, um, I can be at work, um, and that gives uh, gives me time freedom. In that, you know, um, my style of trading is in the longer time frame. So I'm looking; my trades go for anywhere between two days to ten days, um, and so because of that, I'm trading on that time frame. I'm not in front of the screens um, all day, every day. Um, you know, I'm placing my trades in the morning um, for the first couple of hours of the, uh, of the trading session. I'm doing research and finding where I want to uh, trade and if there's any trades available that I'm placing them. And if I'm in positions, then I'm managing those, those positions and then, you know, going off and doing what I um, what I want to do for the rest, rest of the day, which is, you know, supporting... Um, this business, uh, pretty much, or spending time with family. What keeps me interested in um, in the markets is that cause and effect. You know, that's I, I always enjoy understanding, as you, you said before, geopolitics. But um, you know, I enjoy reading about uh, what's happening in the world, um, having a finger on the pulse of what's happening in the world, and understanding well. If this happens, then um, you know, history showed that. That's going to happen. So um, we can see this coming, and then we'll know, we know when to be looking for that trade and uh, what direction we should be taking it. So, yeah, I guess it's, I don't know if that's um, a weird thing, but uh, that's always kept me interested over the years. Um, and the motivation for, um, for trading and, and doing it is, I guess, to, um, you know, not self, but more about. Um, Providing something for the family and um, providing a legacy for uh, for the kids to um, to have. Um, thank you very much, David, for this enlightening conversation. So your experience and perspective are truly invaluable. Being in the industry for so long. Well, I, I appreciate the time, and I, uh, I want to thank you for um, being a great interviewer, and also for uh, giving me the time to uh, to have uh, have with you and. Um, I wish you all the best with it and uh, yeah, look forward to maybe another one some, sometime in the future. Me too as well. Thank you so much.